Hello and welcome to Speech Communication 4397, Effective Meeting Management. Uh, you'll see from the size of our studio class that most of this class is probably home in bed or taping this. Uh, we are television with class and uh, many of the people participating for credit in this course are home viewers and so we say welcome to you. Darren, are you out west today? Okay, uh, we have one fellow at Cinco Ranch that uh, may be checking in with us later on, and we will see about that. Okay, this is a class in meeting management. It means that we're going to be talk ab talking about kinds of meetings and how meetings work, and we'll be talking further about that in just a minute. Uh, I am Dr. Martha Hahn. Uh, let me give you some phone numbers here. Let me get the zoom to work. Okay, my number is there. Uh, the television assistant, Ginger Yoakum, is listed. Ginger, if you'll just walk down the center aisle and turn around and wave to everybody uh, so that you folks at home uh, have an idea of who it is you might be phoning. This is Ginger Yoakum. She worked, stand there a minute, let him get a good look at you. Uh, she worked uh, a previous semester with us when we did the crisis communication class. And so she's an experienced person at this. She'll be happy to take your calls. Uh, her home number is on your class syllabus. We chose not to broadcast that over 33 counties. Uh, the phone number, you can sit down now if you want to. Uh, the phone number that you see here is uh, my voicemail number at the University of Houston and one of the two of us will pick up on that and return your call as soon as possible. Uh, I'm really slow at answering email but in the event that you have a student account and that is a free account that you can uh, get through computer services on campus, my email address and it's all lowercase letters is com11f at pop dot uh dot edu com one one f at pop dot uh dot edu and uh, so if you want to send a, a message just to let me know you're out there uh, you know, we'll uh, make connection that way there is not any homework or anything like that that has to be sent in over email so if you are not an email person yet that's okay uh, you'll be fine okay the a uh, distance learning number I think is going to come up during the uh, course of this broadcast, but uh, if you have questions about registration, if you're not getting information when uh, you think it should be arriving and so forth, then uh, you can dial that number 395-2800 and you'll get a computerized menu with information on that. Okay, if someone were to hand you this gavel and say, you know, I'm going to be uh, absent this afternoon from the committee meeting, could you just go in and chair the meeting for me and let me know what happens? Would you be okay doing that? Now, Nicole better be because she's had parliamentary procedure and passed it with flying colors, you know. Uh, if someone said, uh, there's a civic club meeting a week from tomorrow, I've done the agenda, but I'm going to be absent, Could, you're the vice president, can you chair that meeting for me? Would you be able to go in and do that? If someone came to you and said, we'd like to nominate you to be the state president of organization XYZ, will you run? Well, you'd probably have to say, what are the duties of that president? Or, you know, make this a national association, whatever size you would like. Uh, would you be able to preside at a state or regional or national convention? One of the things that's often involved in being elected to that kind of position uh, involves the convention planning. If you are in that track to become president, uh, there's a fair chance that uh, you don't just become president. You know, you have to be 
vice president-elect and then vice president or president-elect. They have different labels that they place on those. But uh, the job of the vice president or the president-elect very often is to plan the annual meeting, to plan the state or national convention. Uh, in the case of the National Speech Association, uh, I don't know, there are probably more than 1,500 programs that are booked into four or five days of activities. I've never actually counted uh, all of those, but they're coded with numbers and it's very complicated. So part of what we'll be looking at in here uh, has to do with the kinds of meetings that exist, because we're going, I'm going to show you some uh, data on surveys uh, from surveys in a little while that show the kinds of meetings that Americans go to, the length of those meetings, the amount of money that they spend on those meetings. Uh, it's a very complicated process and in many instances there are uh, professional meeting managers, uh, uh, people who make a career out of managing meetings and so we'll be uh, looking at the roles, in the course of the semester, we'll be looking at the roles that those people play and uh, what they're doing in terms of a profession in getting ready for those kinds of meetings. So, you know, in your own head, ask, and, and as we uh, get back to Robert's Rules of Order, or get to Robert's Rules of Order, which will be, we won't cover this whole book but there's some very important sections in there that help you understand the differences between committee meetings and board meetings and annual meetings and regular meetings and seminars and conventions. There's a whole section in the back on conventions that from a procedural standpoint, uh, the types of committees that must be formed and that must meet in order for a convention to be legitimate, in order for business to be properly uh, conducted. And we'll get to those kinds of things later on. You can check your syllabus if you're curious about uh, specific dates. But the level of responsibility that you have varies a great deal between whether or not you're asked to chair a committee meeting of five or seven people, or whether or not you're the president of a state association, or whether or not you're the professional meeting manager for a convention of 30 or 40,000 people. So we're going to be looking at this course from two perspectives as we look at effective meeting management. One perspective is if you're the person in charge of the meeting, if it's your job to chair the committee, uh, to be the president, you know, what kinds of things do you have to do in order to get the agenda ready, uh, to make sure people have the appropriate task delegated, those kinds of things. Uh, on the other side, that when, as meetings become more frequent, we're going to see shortly that there are many organizations that have meeting planners and you can make anywhere from 20000 a year to over $100,000 a year if you've got enough experience and education and expertise uh, going in as a professional meeting planner. Uh, some people I know have gone into meeting planning kind of as a convention services approach to a career. Uh, one of our speech majors recently got her cards printed up and she's planning special events and she kind of works with a, a particular clientele that she's developed. Uh, but she's, she's working her way into that field. She's a mom, she's a student, and helping certain groups plan their meetings is, makes a nice part-time job for her. But we'll look at some profiles of education and experience and opportunities, so forth. So you'll see a shifting roles uh, from time to time in here. Primarily on the front end, we'll be talking about the role of the professional meeting manager and all the kinds of factors that go into planning some of these really big uh, meetings, whether it's, it's a major convention with voting delegates, whether it's a, a national seminar uh, that brings people in for three or four days, whatever. Uh, and then we'll kind of work our way to the more specific level. Uh, if you've received your syllabus, and some of you got those mailed out to you, some may need to put a phone call in. 
uh, and of course the studio class has theirs, you'll see on there that we have several guest speakers who are coming. Uh, Dr. Michael Fain, who works with the forensics program uh, at the University of Houston, is going to talk to us on September 7th about managing tournaments. That's the probable date he'll come. We may all of these speakers are subject to change and adjustment based on schedule. But he'll be talking about managing speech tournaments. Now it's not important that you learn how to specifically run a speech tournament. That's the point of this lecture. But the point of having him come is to have you understand the kinds of processes that are involved when there is a big event occurring. And in, if you want to watch one, uh, in mid-September we will have a high school tournament with probably some 1,000 students from the area on this campus. And that's a massive undertaking. The tab room uh, is a very complicated place. It takes lots of committees. It takes a number of people in charge. The process for running such a tournament started weeks ago. Uh, when he was over at Rice University a few years ago, he ran the National Individual Events Tournament. And you know, that brought in schools from all over the country. So the, the point is not how do you power match debate teams or how do you decide which students go into the final round of duet acting. The point is when you have a massive job to do, how do you divide those tasks up in a meaningful way, set up committees, assign jobs, get timelines, how do you get yourself organized you know, when, you, when you find out uh, what it is you need to do. Okay, we'll have some hotel reps coming in. Uh, we have Jane Jordan from the Hyatt Regency scheduled, and she will talk, among other things, about negotiating hotel contracts. Uh, if you're the meeting planner, whether you're the person that signs on the bottom line, or if it's your job to take that contract to the executive director and say, this is in good order, you can check it over and sign it. You know, but someone has to negotiate the contract. And with big conventions like National Speech Association, Speech Communication Association of America, SCA, uh, those contracts are signed as much as five years out. Large fraternities, uh, any really large organization may block with a given hotel uh, for five, some may even block seven or ten year contracts. Five is the longest that I'm aware of. But you know, my experience is more than yours, but limited uh, by, in comparison to what you'll see with some of these profiles that we're going to observe. Uh, some groups will block with a given hotel for five years because they'll get a better uh, discount because the hotel can count on that business. If you work for a hotel, and by the time you get through looking at all these travel brochures and uh, things, and we're, we're going to do some sightseeing via video, and I'll say more about that in a minute. Uh, you may decide that the career you want is within the hotel industry. And uh, the Stephanie Mulet, who is listed as a guest, <clears throat> did not go through typical hotel restaurant management training, although a number of their sales reps do. Uh, Stephanie is a former speech communication major, and I'm not even sure how she landed the job that she has, but she works now with catering at the Western Oaks and Western Galleria. And she will come in and talk to you about food services, special events, uh, those unique things. Uh, the Galleria hotels, for example, if they have a large enough group and the situation is warranted, can book the ice rink, cover it, and serve your banquet out there in the middle of the ice rink in the heart of the Galleria. Now, if that's the sort of thing that, apply, that applies, that appeals to your clientele, you know, that could be very exciting. Uh, maybe you've got a group that needs a 50s party, you know, black and pink balloons and poodle skirts and bring in a dance troupe that can jitterbug or what, yeah, I don't know. There are all kinds of special events that are possibilities. And so Stephanie will be talking with us about some of those uh, things. And in both cases, from the hotels, uh, the representatives will be talking about things that you can reasonably expect and things that you should not expect. 
you know, if, if you have a large enough population coming in, <coughs> excuse me, then uh, complimentary rooms are a given part of that. There are special services that your VIPs may get. Uh, but if you have a, a tiny little group of 10 or 12 people coming in, you may or may not get special perks. So they'll be looking at, at some of those kinds of things and talking to you about what's reasonable, <clears throat> how the rates vary from, you know if you just walk in the door of uh, a well-known hotel, the walk-in rate is very expensive. And if you've gone to a convention, you may discover that your convention rate is $75 or $86 a night plus tax. Uh, and the sign on the back of the door says this room normally uh, goes for a rate of $185 or $200. You're thinking, gee, what a good deal I got. And you did, <clears throat> because when groups are booked in, uh, there's some real advantages to that for the hotel and there are advantages for the people who are attending as well. Then we'll get, uh, we have representative coming from the Houston Convention Bureau, and um, I'll save comments on that until later, but uh, Dennis will share with you some things that the Bureau can do for you in terms of managing large meetings. Uh, Dr. Robin Williamson will be here talking about small group dynamics, and that's starting our <clears throat> transition over into a different phase kind of, you know, we're, we're moving from the big broad perspective then into uh, smaller meetings about that time. Uh, Dr. Barry Brown is uh, in the School of Communication here as our operations manager and has a number of meetings associated with that. He's also past president of an area civic organization and he'll talk with you about some of the ramifications of those meetings, some of the problems that they ran into, just some of the dimensions of of working with a smaller group. We have the mayor of West University scheduled, uh, William Watson, Bill Watson, Jr., will be here and uh, talk to you about what it's like to be a mayor, what kind of problems and positive as well as negative dimensions, if there are any negative. I haven't been to any, any of his meetings. But anyway, I'll talk about, about the role of the mayor. Uh, it's, there are different aspects and ramifications that are involved when you have volunteer organizations as compared to elected organizations uh, compared to groups of employees. You know, you just have uh, different aspects to that. And we'll be looking next week at some organizational communication dimensions, information flow, some of the factors that uh, work within organizations. But certainly it makes a difference whether people are on the payroll, whether they're volunteers, whether they are elected and responsible to a constituency. And that also affects uh, the nature of some of the meetings that you have too, whether or not you're having uh, conventions with elected delegates, whether you're having uh, annual meetings with voluntary association and so forth. So those are some of the kinds of things we'll be doing. Uh, your syllabus will give you specific dates. There's some Saturday, a couple of Saturday meetings that uh, you need to come in for, and, and this is particularly applicable to you home viewers so that we can get you identified, and uh, your ID will be checked that day so that we uh, know that the name on the class roll does, in fact, uh, match who you are and so forth. But more importantly, we want uh, at least a couple of opportunities to get the whole group together to uh, interface and, and get some direct communication taking place. So these are the kinds of meetings that we'll be looking at in the course of the semester and uh, what the different uh, dimensions of those are. Now if you're in charge of one of these meetings, some of the questions that you need to ask are, who will be attending that meeting? You know, is this a local meeting? Is this a civic club? Uh, is this a state organization? Is this a national convention? Is this a seminar that has a national audience? Is this an international meeting? We won't do much with international, but um, we will allude to it from time to time and uh, 
you know, maybe touch on Canada and Mexico a little bit. I almost feel like Hawaii is international, you know, obviously it isn't, but it's far away, and so we'll have some uh, information on that too. But who is attending this meeting? How long is it going to last? Uh, what will the participants do? You know, what is the purpose of this meeting? Is it a committee meeting? Is it a board meeting? Is it an annual meeting? Uh, we'll talk about agendas on down the line when, where if you are the presiding officer, you're responsible for figuring out you know, the specifics in terms of topics that will be going on for that day. And then we'll be looking at who is in charge of what. You know, if you've got this state convention occurring, if it's time for the executive board meeting, if it's the annual or the monthly meeting of the board of directors, you know, who is responsible for what? And we'll be talking about what the meeting planner does, whether you're the volunteer, whether you are uh, an elected officer who inherited the job by virtue of your office, whether you're being paid big bucks to do this. What does the meeting planner, planner do? That will, of course, vary according to the kind of meeting, the size of the meeting, and so forth. What does the presiding officer do? And those people are sometimes called chairman or president or any of a number of other labels. Uh, we'll spend less time on that, but we want, you know, if someone hands you the gavel, I want you to know what you're supposed to do with it. I won't be able to test you this semester to find out because we don't get into that much depth in this class. But you ought to know how to put an agenda together, what an order of business is, and uh, in the last one-third or so of the semester, uh, we're going to do a little bit of parliamentary procedure. Uh, I think we're going to have some building blocks so we can sit in here and stack some motions up and uh, practice working with those. And then what does the parliamentarian do? And again, this will be a small part of uh, what we're addressing in here. But that's a third role that interfaces, and it sometimes overlaps. And if you are the elected president, there are some situations where you're functioning as your own parliamentarian. You are the meeting planner. You know, all three of these roles may converge in some situations. And so we'll be looking at some of that. We are very fortunate to have permission from a magazine in Birmingham, Alabama called Convene to use the information that uh, we have that's wrong uh, in this. We, they have agreed that we may look at their color graphs, that we can uh, use whatever we need to within that. Uh, Amy Cates, who is the managing editor was very excited about the fact that we were going to be on public television with this course and was delighted that, that, that this magazine may be of service uh, to you as students. This is a magazine, that, as the, probably can't read this little title up here, but it says the Journal of the Professional Convention Management Association. And there are people who pay dues, there are national, uh, there's some other organizations we'll mention later on. But there are uh, professional groups of meeting managers. They meet together to figure out how to plan meetings and so forth. But through uh, compliments of Convene, we're going to be able to do things like take a visual tour of Hawaii. A little too much stuff here. Uh, Canada. You know, they put out special features on, on numbers of groups. Here's Atlanta, Georgia, Memphis, Tennessee, and we'll come back to these another time, you know, Virginia, because many of you have not yet traveled to those locations. And if you were planning meetings in that part of the country, you know, if for what the, the distribution of your membership is such that it's useful uh, to travel that direction for, for whatever reason, we'll find that it's helpful to do that. We also have compliments of, see if I can get their name up here for you. Uh, 
audiovisual presentations in Fort Worth, Texas. Later on, we'll be looking at some videos. Uh, this particular one is on Dallas. They have a series called Where America Meets. Uh, I just brought one over today, but I have this one on Dallas. There's one on Scottsdale, Arizona, and there's one on Hawaii. So instead of, now the last time this class met, we did the tour of the Galleria and, and toured the two hotels over there. And our feet were really tired, you know, just to, or most of us at least, uh, at the end of, of a walking tour of two hotels and, and those shops. So this semester we're going to be able to sit back and most of these tapes run about 20 minutes. Uh, we have a, uh, about a 10 minute tape on Houston. And so we'll be able to uh, tour via video airports, rental car facilities, and some wonderful hotels. You know, you'll just want to go out and volunteer to be a meeting manager for somebody so you can plan these wonderful uh, trips and things before it's over with. Okay, I want to spend some time with you today uh, doing part of the profile that uh, Convene has made possible for us looking at types of organizations, kinds of meetings, this will be clear as we get on into it. Uh, they had uh, about 225 um, national organizations that responded. This is the first time we've used graphics out of magazines, so this may take a minute. Okay, you don't have to write all of this down. I want you to get a feel for the kinds of trends and things uh, that are going on. But over 200 organizations responded. And of those, this big area that you see, these were professional societies. And there are, for example, uh, some 35, 33, 35 professional fraternities in this country. Uh, there's one in speech, communication, theater, performing arts called Phi Beta. Uh, but there, there are groups similar to that, and just the professional fraternities, when combined, uh, represent over one and a half million people. Some of the fraternities have annual conventions of four or five thousand people, some of those larger fraternities. Well, this particular segment uh, represents not only uh, groups like professional fraternities, but all the professional societies, American Medical Association, Dental Association, Bar Association, you know, there are just lots of professional groups out there that are meeting. Uh, what should be lavender on your screen, you never know if your set's like mine, uh, these are trade associations over here. Uh, the yellow section, they've labeled SMURF, that refers to social, military, educational, religious, and they have fraternal, and I think that means social fraternal, social sorority, social fraternities in that case. So just to give you an idea of who it is that answered this questionnaire, uh, you've largely got professional and trade association people that provided this data. Okay, so what kind of membership then do these folks have? Well, most of their membership is national, okay? Uh, but there's a large international component as well. Uh, roughly 44% national, 35% international. Uh, and that's of the people responding. You probably know from your own experiences that there are a lot of state organizations. Uh, Texas Speech Communication Association, which is uh, the professional group for folks like myself, high school speech teachers, um, probably has a membership of 1,000 people, 400 of whom uh, turn out to state convention each year. And you just amplify that across all kinds of uh, professions around the state. So there are lots of organizations out there that aren't reflected in this particular survey. Uh, the green segment is regional. That little tiny blue sliver is local. And, there are a few people that they sent surveys to who didn't answer them or who didn't answer that question. I think the response rate was 
30 percent, I'm not sure. Uh, anytime you send out a questionnaire, you know, you never get all the people. Okay, how large is the membership of your association? Uh, just kind of looking at these little bar graphs, less than 1,000, 1,000 to 5,000, and that was the most, those were the most frequent reporters here. 5,000 to 10,000, 10 to 25,000, 25 to 50,000, but nearly 13 percent had more than 50,000 members. So you've got a portion of organizations here that are very large uh, organizations. Okay, what percentage of your membership is outside of the United States? Well, 57 percent said less than 5 percent. So most of these people uh, reporting have most of their members in the United States, and that's the point of view uh, from which we'll be generalizing as we move along. And then there's just a little smattering of other segments there. Okay, now you may find uh, this interesting, and this, this is the report from their third annual meetings market survey, and this was published in March of 1994. That may or may not be readable to you. We're going to get an update in a minute with some additional information uh, from the March 95 survey. But in 94, they reported the annual budget for their association in 93. You know, what kind of money do you have uh, for this? And 1 million to 4.9 million is the predominant. I mean, the mean is 4.233525 and so forth. Uh, but there, there's a lot of money being invested in meetings. And you can just kind of get a feel for that. Okay, how many people do you think would be in a department helping plan these kinds of meetings? Well, the mean is 4.13, this yellow bar says 2 to 4. So in a few instances, <laughs> you know, I guess that's 1.3% didn't have anybody planning them, so I'm not quite sure. Um, how they did that, if they just had an announcement that we will meet, you know, I'm not sure what that means. Uh, uh, about a fourth, though, only had one person doing this, you know, almost half, two to four. Uh, over here is five to nine, and in some instances you have more than ten people. It came out 11.1 percent, but there are people uh, out there doing these things in most instances. <coughs> Okay, what kind of budget did they have in 93? How large, here's the top of this. How large was your association's convention meeting budget in 93? And the mean came out $557,798. That's a lot of money for meetings, at least from our point of view on a university campus. Okay, you've got, oh, just under 6% spending less than 50000 about 7.5% spending fifty to 100000 17, nearly 18% spending between 100000 and 249, well, 250000 uh, another 17.7% over here in the 250 to 500,000, 17.7% in 250. Looks like a repeat there, I'm not sure what they did with that one. 30% uh, spending more than a million dollars with their convention meeting budget. And of course these are the groups having lots of meetings generally. Okay, how did the budget in 93 compare with 92? And we'll look at the 94 uh, figures in a minute. Uh, most of the people had an increase. So 51 percent had an increase. The lavender section uh, shows uh, no change. Some groups had a little bit of a decrease and some didn't answer that question. And down here at the bottom how did the projected 94 convention meeting budget compare with 93? 
and you've got a similar graph there. The, the fine lines between those are not important for what we're doing. Okay, where does an organization get its money? What's the principal source of your association's income? And of course, it'll vary some according to uh, the type of group. But you can see up here, most associations get their money from dues. And, and of course, that is a function, too, that most of the people returning these questionnaires were professional and trade association groups. So you have a number of businesses that uh, do their own in-house training or they have incentive meetings for their own employees and there is some, probably some reflection of that data in this information. But just remembering that the people who answered the questionnaire uh, tend to be people from professional groups and trade associations. Their money at least is coming from dues and it's coming from the conventions and the exhibits meetings. And we'll talk some later on because one of the things you have to take into account is exhibit space if you have a group that does exhibits. Um, state speech teachers need an area about the size of the front of this room for some book exhibits. The uh, National Speech Convention needs an area the size of the Houston room at the University Center probably, maybe even larger. Uh, to handle all the, the book reps and different groups that display at a national convention. If you have uh, a homeowners association or a boat show or, you know, you're showing uh, cars, if it's an auto show or something, the exhibitor space may be so large that you need a place like Astro Hall to handle all of it. So it depends on what your group is and what the needs of the particular group are as to how much space you will need. But anyway, the, the dues are a big chunk of income in this particular survey, about 42%. Another 31% from the convention itself from the exhibits. Most exhibitors will pay a fee. It, it depends on what the deal is. That's one of those things you have to negotiate. If you really want the exhibitor there and they're not inclined to spend the money to come, then you may, your organization may need to pick up the uh, financial end of that space and say, you know, we'll give you the free space if you'll just pay to get the display here, get a representative from your company here. Uh, in other instances, you know, if it's a health care organization or something, the, the exhibitors may be so eager to show their wares to your group that you can charge them anywhere from a, a hundred or a hundred and fifty dollars to five hundred, I don't know what the ceiling is on uh, charging exhibitors, but some organizations make a substantial amount of their income off of the fees that they charge to the exhibitors, and that's just one of those variables that uh, comes into play with the organization. Okay, and then this is broken on down by the trade associations, the professional societies, and the SMURF organizations, uh, the social military, etc groups, you'll see have a number of other, the, the pie graph skews a little bit uh, on that one. And they're likely to be drawing less income from the conventions and uh, exhibitor space. Okay, how many events with exhibits does your association sponsor each year? And most, 50% of those reporting, I guess that's, that's barely most, it's a very slim majority, but 50% do one. And then you'll see that the others uh, scatter across there. And there's some groups that have no exhibitor space. And that's just the way it is. You know, it's simply a function of the group. It's, it's just one of those variables that we're aware of and take into account as may be appropriate. Uh, some have two, some three to five. A few, five to ten, uh, looks like about five, well, 6.2 percent have more than ten. Okay, what is the net square footage of your largest exposition? Now, this becomes a relevant, in fact, we can do this. Uh, this becomes a relevant factor when later on 
we start to look at, and I'll just give you those numbers in a minute. Uh, when we start to look at hotels, and we'll look at some floor plans of hotels, the sizes of ballrooms, can the ballroom be uh, broken out into, in some instances, you need to take a ballroom and break it up into little meeting rooms. Uh, if you've got 2,000 professors all you know, reading papers in small groups simultaneously, and you need 50 breakout rooms at the same time, that's a different thing from if you need to be able to take all the walls out and use the whole ballroom, uh, whether it's for the big closing banquet or for exhibition space or whatever. So the net square footage of your largest exposition, uh, less than 25,000 net square feet, you've got about 38% of the reporting groups falling in that category. From 25,000 to 50,000, about a fourth. 50,000 to 100,000, 16%. 100,000 to 250,000, 12.6%. And more than 250,000 square feet. Now you may have to think about that number going home and I didn't compare it to the floor size of the Astro Hall, but you know, that's a lot of space, 250,000 square feet. And there's nearly you know, 4.7 percent, nearly 5 percent. So there are some organizations that need big space. And that will uh, eliminate or rule out a number of the hotels that you can use in the first place. You know, there's some, some chains that you can simply eliminate because they don't even have a ballroom. Uh, even if you start looking around the Houston area, you know, there are uh, some hotels with lovely ballrooms. The Texas Speech Association, for example, usually uh, needs eight to ten breakout rooms at three or four points during the day. And there are a limited number of hotels that have that many uh, rooms, say, the size of this one, that you can put 15 to 30 people into uh, if we took the tables. We'll also look at uh, the difference in rooms, you know, these are set up classroom uh, style with tables. If you took the tables out and put a theater arrangement in, just rows of chairs, you obviously could get more people in. So when you start to look at some of the uh, data on hotels, you'll see that you get different room capacities. How many people can you put in the room if they're just all standing up, milling around? How many people can you seat uh, theater style? How many people will fit in there uh, in a classroom arrangement? How many people will fit if you put rounds of eight or ten for a banquet? You know, and we would lose some more space in this room uh, if we were to set it up banquet style. Okay, but we're on expositions. All right now, we'll move along a little bit here. Uh, how many individual exhibitors reserve space in your largest 1993 show? Okay, 24.7, less than 50, about 18%, 50 to 99, uh, about 29%, 100 to 250. So, you know, that's a hardy number of people. That involves a lot of communication uh, in working with that. As the meeting planner, you may or may not be the person directly involved with that. It may be your job to simply um, make the space available, set up the procedure. It may be the executive secretary or um, some sort of assistant who actually takes the phone calls, books the people into the space, uh, works out the specifics of uh, collecting their money, having them fill out information forms about special needs, uh, those kinds of things. Okay, some 15%, 250 to 499, about 10% uh, have more than 500. And when you're getting 500 exhibitors on a location, you've got your hands full, you know, probably with 100, you, <laughs> many of us would have our hands full. So if you have more than a few, you know, the odds are this is one of those areas that you need to delegate responsibility. You need some help. Uh, you may need a whole committee functioning in that area. But if you are the meeting planner, whether you're the professional and paid for it, or the vice president or president-elect who inherited it for the sake of glory, 
or whatever, or friendship, whatever it may be. Uh, you need to recognize the needs that you have and the responsibilities, and, and it's all part of that timeline and, and organizational uh, development that you have in getting your tasks delineated. Okay, how did the number of exhibitors in 93 compare with 92? Uh, most of them had some increase, but a big chunk had no change. A few dropped off. What's your projection for 94? Um, most of them said no change. Uh, some expected an increase. Uh, at least you've got an optimistic group here who was not expecting uh, decreases. Okay, what was the attendance at the largest annual convention meeting or exposition that your association sponsored? Uh, less than a thousand. We've got a lot of state and regional and local organizations. Not that, well, we didn't have very many local reporting in this survey. Okay, uh, but nearly 38% had between one and 5,000 people. At least a thousand people. And anytime you've got a thousand people at a function, you've got your hands full. And like I said, if you want to see a thousand high school students running around here in a couple of weeks, uh, you can, if you want to help us, we'd be glad to anybody out there listening who wants to help uh, from you know, carrying sacks of ice to assisting us. In other ways, there'll be lots of jobs out. If we've got some people who want to judge, uh, you know, we've got some experience at that. If you want to keep time, if you just want to come listen, uh, that's fine too. Okay, you know, you got a chunk here, 5,000 to 10,000, 10,000 to 25,000, the little green bar, 25,000 to 50,000, and more than 50,000 in attendance, only 1.3%. But still, that's a handful of organizations that have some massive groups in attendance. And as we look at uh, different organizations, uh, not organizations, it was, as we take a look at different cities, you know, whether it's Memphis or Atlanta or whatever, uh, we'll be finding information in there that says the city as a whole has X number of hotels, the hotels combined have so many uh, meeting rooms, so many hotel rooms, uh, X number of these are adjacent to our new and wonderful convention center which will hold so many thousand people. Now there are some times that you are looking at the city as a whole. You're not just saying which hotel do I like the best, can I get the best room rate on, uh, who's got rooms that open out to the swimming pool, you know, and that's sometimes a factor involved. But uh, it depends on the size of the group and sometimes you are not just doing site inspection by hotel property but you're doing the inspection based on the city as a whole. And as we look at uh, some of these tapes, we'll see you know, the ability to get your people from the airport to the hotel, the, be the ability to move them from multiple hotels to the convention center. Some of those kinds of things are factors that we have to take into account as well. Okay, revenues, just, this is kind of for fun, but for your largest event, what percentage of the revenue uh, was generated by each of the following? Well, 47% came from registration. And you'll find that with many organizations, uh, the convention fee is what covers the cost of the event. But there are some groups like sororities and fraternities that often fly the chapter delegates in. You know, they pay for the representatives to come. There are um, uh, trade associations, there are business groups that pay for their employees to come. Now some of those things, you know, come out of the annual operating budget of the organization, uh, whatever the business might be, and they, they simply budget for that annually, that the top salesperson in each area or the outstanding whatever of the year in each district uh, will be the person selected to attend. In other instances, the delegates or their chapters or their parent associations, whatever they may be, are responsible for paying that. And the convention fee, and we'll look at those more specifically as we look at specific convention planning, 
But the registration fee for the convention may cover the meals, uh, may throw in an extra anywhere from 10 to $50 to cover uh, convention packets. Sometimes you get leather portfolios as part of the, or you may get t-shirts that are dyed, or not dyed, that have uh, matching logos. Those can, you know, there are all kinds of little perks like that that help build the camaraderie of the organization, uh, build the unity of the group. But somebody has to pay for that. And so it's just one of those planning factors that goes in. Do we build this into uh, the registration cost? or is it paid for by a benefactor. Sometimes if, if you've got a group of chapters, like with a fraternity or sorority, uh, the local host organization or chapters will pay for those things because they don't have to pay for airfare from Houston to San Francisco. So all the members will kick in X number of dollars to uh, help uh, cover memorabilia, things like that. So anyway, we see that a lot of the revenue comes from registration. A lot of it, in the case of these groups reporting, comes from exhibit sales. But we also saw that there were some organizations that don't have exhibit sales. <clears throat> so it may or may not apply. Uh, sponsorship and grants. Uh, some groups are fortunate enough to have rich benefactors who just say, you know, I, I think so-and-so ought to be able to attend and Here's an extra $10,000 for the convention budget and, you know, bring two delegates from the chapters. Well, that won't cover that. Here's an extra thirty or 40000 You know, bring uh, two chapter delegates instead of one. This year, or bring a backup, your bylaws. We'll talk about bylaws later on. Uh, but the bylaws of an organization often specify what the makeup will be at an annual meeting or at a convention. Okay, and then this is broken out further by trade associations, professional societies, and uh, Smurf groups. It varies a little bit. The trade associations get a little more from exhibit sales than the others two, other two do. Uh, the professional and Smurf tend to pick up more from the registration fees. Okay, what percentage of expense did each of the following account for? Okay, this is, is while well, you don't have to remember the numbers, it's an important factor. Food and beverage is taking 25.9% here. And this is one of the reasons we have a director of catering sales coming in to talk with us. Uh, most conventions have luncheons, they have a closing banquet, they may have all of the, the above. You have to decide which way you're going to go with this. If you don't plan meal functions, you all, you're more likely to have to pay for the room space in the hotel, the meeting room space. <clears throat> Any room that's used for a meal function, they almost always waive the cost of the room. You may still have to pay for the microphone and the overhead projector and you know, a number of, of equipment costs, but the room will be complimentary because of the meal function. If you uh, put a convention up at Greens Point Mall, so it's convenient to the Houston Intercontinental Airport, or you put a convention in the Galleria, and whether you're talking 50 people or 1,000 here is beside the point, if you put those people in meal functions, you, know, you have more work to do, but you know where your people are. If you turn them loose, and say, oh, you know, there are lots of places to eat in the Galleria, there are lots of places to eat in the mall, what's going to happen? Oh, and I forgot to tell you studio folks to hold your little microphone buttons down if you want to say something real. So, Darren, did you ever show up out west? Yeah, I did. Hi, Darren. How are you doing? Okay. He's, you, know, you just need to buzz in and say, hey, I'm here, because you're our, our lone rep out there. But we've got about 30 people at home viewing this as well. So, but um, the, the voice of Darren, we expect to hear. Uh, we know that you traveled. Darren went off to Cape Cod last year, and what Acapulco? Aruba. Aruba. Okay. What other neat places have you been? Oh, Nassau, Cancun, Virgin Islands. Okay, this is Mr. Perrier talking to us. So, do you plan the incentive meetings for your groups? Yes, we do. Okay. So. 
Where's I'm going to Barton Creek in Austin in about uh, a month, taking about 80 people. Great. So there are some groups that do nice things for their employees. Oh, we hope the officials of the university are watching and listening. <laughs> we have faculty retreats and meeting rooms on campus. <laughs> okay. Uh, but anyway, Darren, we expect to have some input from time to time. And uh, he's done this remote stuff before, so he knows how to buzz in. But those of you in the studio, if you will hold down your little uh, microphone buttons when you talk, then Darren can hear you, and the people who are at home will have the benefit of your comments as well. Okay, but anyway, we're on this particular graph, which shows that a big chunk of the budget goes for food and beverage. Uh, most groups, I think, have discovered that they need cash bars for alcohol. Uh, because they can't afford <laughs> what their delegates are capable of consuming. Uh, it also <laughs> helps in moderation there. Okay, what else we got? Marketing and promotion takes about 12.5%. Speakers and entertainment, 10% or so. You know, that's going to vary uh, by the group, but there's usually a president's reception, you know, an outgoing bash for uh, whoever it is each year. Some officers are on a one-year cycle, some two years, some three. I don't think I'm aware of any presidents that are elected for longer than, elected for longer than three-year terms. Okay, audio-visual, depending on the group. Speech Association, for example, needs a fair amount of audio-visual. They play some tapes, um, just need that equipment. They may, may need overhead projectors and so forth. Uh, some of, of your better hotels and you can use that term loosely and fill in the blank for yourself. <laughs> I don't want to get caught for bad-mouthing anybody here. But some hotels have overhead projectors and screens in the room to start with, and we'll make those complimentary for you. Uh, if you've been in hotels much, you may find the little uh, wooden panels behind, you know, on one side of the room. You simply open those doors up, and, there, and we'll look at some of that later on. Uh, but there may be... Uh, an erasable marker board back there, a screen that pulls down uh, some of those amenities. Some of the groups that build themselves as conference centers, and we'll talk about those in the course of the semester too, are particularly geared for business meetings. And uh, they'll have, they may have more equipment amenities than other groups. But in other situations, you know, you may be paying for grand uh, hotels that have massive chandeliers and ballrooms to die for and uh, those kinds of things create experiences that are different from your conservative get down to business kind of atmosphere. So part of what we'll be doing when, when we view the tapes uh, is looking at the ambiance of different hotels. Most of you have had some nonverbal communication along the way somewhere and, and are aware of how much the environment that affects uh, what's going on, you know, but do you want a hotel with a revolving restaurant on top? Do you want a hotel that the whole top floor is the restaurant? You know, uh, I ate dinner on top of a Hilton in San Francisco with a view of the Golden Gate Bridge. That was fine. That was worth every dollar. I, I paid well for that meal, you know, but it was worth it because it's a memory uh, that stands out in the midst of lots of convention papers, uh, lots of, of busy work. You know. So we'll look at those kinds of factors as we start comparing types of hotels uh, later on. Okay, audiovisual, uh, decorator, labor. Some groups decorate a lot, others don't. Uh, I went in, I don't even know what the group was, but I went into one hotel that had massive balloons in various colors creating this glorious archway. You know, now they had to pay somebody for a lot of balloons and helium and labor. You'd have had to pay me to get up the ladder, <laughs> you know, to string that stuff up. But it was wonderful. And, uh, you know, sometimes you're doing big ice carvings or whatever. So anyway, decorations may be a factor. Staff travel and accommodations. Most groups pay for uh, the officers, at least. And if it's a business group, then and an incentive trip, you know, they'll have a much higher overhead on that. Okay, registration, housing, uh, 
and then it's just called destination management. Sometimes you have to rent space, you have to rent copy machines. We'll get into those kinds of things more later on too, but, but there are various types of expenses uh, that run with those. Okay, if you are spending uh, money, okay, our basic question up here was the percentage of expenses that each of these accounted for. And then it's broken out further in shows of 100,000 to 250,000 square feet. We won't bog down in that. But the space rental is a biggie. Food and beverage is large. Uh, decoration and labor. If, if you're doing exhibit booths, then you're going to need a lot of the pipe and curtain stuff so that you can tell one booth from another. You generally don't just tell people, OK, that's your corner and that's your space. Uh, if you've got 50 book exhibitors coming in, for example, they need some means of designating that. Uh, depending on what the group is, some uh, groups bring in their own uh, uh, hard back backing and display boards and create a little cubby effect with all of their own stuff. We'll see more about that later on. Okay, small meetings. Let's shift our focus here for a minute. We've, we've been talking about the really big stuff, but the, the little meetings continue. You know, and, and many of you are part of many meetings per week. So how many small meetings did your association sponsor in 1993? Now this doesn't just mean how many committee meetings did you go to in a given week, but these are actually the little sponsored meetings that were organized, formally identified, announced, and so forth. Uh, fewer than five, about 22 percent, five to nine, 16 percent, uh, 23 percent, 10 to 24, but more than 100, nearly 12 percent. So there's some groups with lots of organized meetings taking place. Uh, the next graph shows that that number is substantially up. The Lavender group is no change, uh, but 25 percent or so of those had an increase from uh, 1992 to 1993. And looking at the little bottom pie graph, uh, most of them said they didn't think they'd have a change from 93 to 94, but about 17 percent expected that number uh, to go on up even further. Okay, now we're back to looking at kinds of meetings. Now, what were those small meetings? What percentage of your small meeting is represented by the following? Seminars, 28.5%. Committee meetings, 33.3%. Okay, so we'll be talking later on about what goes into a committee meeting, setting the agenda, uh, the things that we have to say about parliamentary procedure are applicable to the conduct of those meetings. Some groups work very well with general consent. And, you know, if it's a small enough group, the smaller the group, the more likely you are to be able to sit around a conference table and work it out and work out your differences and, and finally arrive at uh, some kind of either general consent or group consensus. The larger the group gets, and we saw that some of these meetings are very, very large, and the larger the group gets, the more likely you are to need a formal procedure. Uh, surveys by National Association of Parliamentarians and American Institute of Parliamentarians suggest that between 85%, uh, some surveys even say 93%, uh, that up to 93% or so of the country uh, relies on Robert's Rules of Order. So that's the one that we'll refer to in here. Some groups use Sturgis, uh, there's Demeter, PC, Farwell, there are a number of other sources uh, that are available that somewhere between eight, maybe even as much as 15 percent of the country use. You know, the surveys vary depending on who you send the questionnaires to. Uh, but for our purposes in here, just because most people uh, use Robert, uh, that's what we'll be referring to. In many instances, there's not a big difference between the parliamentary authorities. There's just some fine uh, points. And if you ever need to give me a call to sort out some of that, I'll clarify it. We can. Okay, the average attendance 
at association-sponsored seminars. Mm, more than 100 is over here on this blue bar, about 28%. Okay, and we won't break. You can see that they kind of distribute. The mean was 72.55. Okay, at training sessions, and for some reason, I don't know if, if the group's reporting didn't do very many training sessions. I'm not sure what happened. Uh, over 58% of the people didn't answer that question. So my group would be, these were, so, uh, my group, my guess would be that these groups uh, were just not into training sessions, even though we know that there are many organizations that are busy with that. So you've got a pretty good uh, distribution here. The training sessions that were held, the mean was uh, 61.49. So a hardy group, but not a difficult uh, to manage group. Okay, now this one you may find interesting, because, especially interesting, because we're going to be I can get this on here, uh, looking at types of properties and, like I said, talking to some representatives from hotels. So what types of facilities hosted the association's off-premise small meetings in 93? You know, many organizations hold their meeting in-house. They've got their own conference rooms uh, at the Texas Medical Center, for example. There, I know at MD Anderson there are some very nice meeting rooms. They're set up with big screens. Do a lot of, of their activity in-house. Uh, but for those groups that left the business site and went other places, where did they go? Well, the type of facilities, 43.6% uh, use downtown hotels. <clears throat> Another substantial chunk used airport hotels. 17.6% is over here at resorts. Uh, the green piece of the pie represents suburban hotels. And then 4.7% represents conference centers. Want to venture any guesses as to why the distribution is that way? Convenience and cost. Okay, Darren says convenience and cost. Which is the most convenient? Uh, uh, either downtown or hotels, depending on where the people are coming so from. Either downtown or... Or the airport hotel. Or the airport hotels. Okay, crucial phrase there, depending on where they're coming from. If you have a board meeting in Chicago in January... It's really nice that there's a hotel right there at O'Hare. It may not be the creme de la creme, but it's got an underground tunnel, and you don't even have to walk outside to get to it. They were supposed to be remodeling after my last meeting there. So that's good. Okay, <clears throat> but cost and convenience are two biggies. I suspect the piece of the pie that conference centers get is as small as it is. Well, let me ask you why. Why do you think conference centers only get 4.7 percent? Gotta get your brains turned on out here. How many conference centers can you name? One? Which one? Okay, that's a convention center. Yeah, that's a convention center, and it's big. Can, you, can anybody name a conference center in Houston? You're about a block from one. Be brave. This is not a test. Yeah, the Hilton Hotel on, com on campus has... Yeah, some of you are not a block from it, but the studio class is sitting here a block from it. Yeah, the Hilton Hotel and Conference Center here on campus. Uh, many of the conference centers are associated with university campuses, and they're small, and they're limited in number compared to the great hotel chains across the country. Uh, many of them are doing nicely. They keep a regular business. Uh, they do what they do very well, but they are limited by size. And given the group that we have reporting here, uh, that affects substantially who they are able to 
receive and accommodate. Okay? Uh, they may not, on the whole, they may not advertise as well as others because they have more limited budgets, more limited resources. Although we'll see as we peruse some of the uh, pages of uh, Convene Magazine, there uh, is an increasing amount of advertising taking place from conference centers. And there's some lovely places, you know, tucked away in the hills of Appalachia or the Rocky Mountains or whatever. And if you have a group that can afford to go there uh, and so forth, they can be really nice. Okay, well, next question, and we're nearly through with this survey. Uh, what percentage of small meetings, oh, and I should have covered that one up. Let me get a guess from you. What percentage of small meetings are, and don't back your tape up and look, you folks at home. Okay, what percentage of small meetings are held in each calendar quarter? When do you, do you have any gut feeling for when people are most likely to hold a meeting? Spring? Fall? April, spring? Yeah, yeah, you're not holding your buttons down, which is why I'm repeating what you're saying. What do you guys think? Spring. Spring, you know, spring. Anybody want to be different? Darren, do your meetings re uh, occur at any particular time? Um, just spring and fall. You know, spring is to follow up on what the plan is, and then fall is, you know, basically what you're going to plan for the next year. Okay, so you do a lot of semi-annual stuff. Yes. Okay. Okay, well this particular survey showed that we've got a real even distribution here. So you may find, you know, and it may be that some of these groups met more than once and were in some sort of semi-annual format. But you have to know the makeup of your organization, the needs of that particular group, uh, what kinds of groups are likely to meet in the summer? You know, this is a range of 21.2% July through September, 24.9% January through March, 26.5% October through December. And those of you that said spring, uh, if we counted as April, you win slightly, 27.4% April through June. Well, what kind of groups are you going to find meeting in the summer? No guesses? Well, we have our work cut out for us in here. Okay, that's fine. Uh, in the summer, you may find school teachers, student organizations. Now, some students meet over spring break, but there are a lot of uh, uh, social fraternity, sorority conventions that occur in July or August. You know, and, and they often do it, uh, hold those meetings in early August so that they get their membership revved up for the fall semester. Okay, but people who are on that nine month block of work and commitment. But there would be another population that meets in summer. And it's so obvious you're not thinking of it. Children uh, going on vacation. Okay, if the junction with the with the okay, convention. many of the conventions are geared so that you know if if you are the business employees, we want you to bring your spouse and your kids, and we're going to meet in Orlando, and then the family can party and vacation. Oh, Nicole, hold your mic down and talk. College orientation. Okay, orientations are good August meetings. Mm -hmm. There may be some brief orientations at other points in the year, but especially August. But as Ginger is saying, groups that are catering to family activities. But then the obvious one is memberships that like summer activities. If you've got a group that wants to go to the Caribbean, I guess you can go there year-round though, can't you? Uh, but you know, if, if you if you have a group that is into golf or um, beach activities, summer activities, whatever all that means to you, then they may pick summer months 
because those activities work better. You know, uh, the reverse of that, there are winter meetings. If, if you've got an organization that's really into skiing, uh, winter sports activities, uh, whatever. Some groups will go the opposite direction from uh, where they normally function just to get a different uh, geographical locale and so on. But the interest of the members, you know, why do people fly all the way to Hawaii for conventions? These two fellows went to conventions, not a convention, but you went to Hawaii. Is it worth it to sit on a plane that long? Worth it, but uh, there's a lot to get you sidetracked. Okay, and that's an important factor too. Well, we're running short on time, oh, but these are some of the kinds of things. Uh, has your association ever held a meeting outside the United States? Of those reporting, a large proportion said yes, but a big chunk also said no. Would you consider holding future meetings outside the U.S.? About half were willing to think about it. Well, we'll update this data uh, next time as we look at the fourth annual review. Uh, it has some different questions, and it won't take us as long uh, to go through it as it did this. But be thinking about who meets where, how long they meet, why they meet, who is in charge of those things, and what kind of responsibilities those individuals have. We'll continue next time. Thank you.